Coming now to the stage, LaShawn Massenberg. Hi, everyone. Um, before I get into my speech, I just want to say that I'll be talking about an issue that's very important to me, and it tends to make me emotional, and I'm still trying to cope with the emotions behind the story, so that um, if I start to cry or I stumble, could you all just give me, like, snaps for support to help me? Thank you. What set you with? What heard you from? What you doing around here? It's phrases like this that I use between gang members. But I've never experienced gang violence face to face. It wasn't until the winter of 2012 where I witnessed gang violence on a first-hand encounter. I was about 12 years old, a young girl outside playing with some friends. And in the distance, I noticed my nephew. He was sprinting towards me as fast as his legs could carry him. And you wouldn't believe what he said to me. Anshan, Anshan, they've got him. He's dead. In that moment, in that moment, my heart shriveled up in my chest. My jaws clenched, my fists tightened, my veins were filled with rage. And before I knew it, I took off running with no feeling in my feet. I ran across the street to the apartment complex where I was living at the time. And there I saw it, the body of my brother wrapped in a white sheet. being removed from where he had taken his last breath. What bothers me the most about his death is that my brother, he wasn't the only victim. In 2015, my city, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., saw a peak in homicide rates. 119 people were killed. No, I don't think y'all heard me. 119 people were killed. This resulted in a 54% increase in the murder rate. And over the past five years, I personally lost nine members to my family. And you know, my brother, he wasn't an angry man, which is why I couldn't even begin to piece together why someone would want to hurt him. But now I have to figure out ways to stop this from happening to someone else's son, brother, or uncle. We need more recreation centers and communities. We need more programs for teenagers who feel like they don't have a family to help fill the void of loneliness. We should have tighter, no, we need tighter laws on gun control to ensure that underage teens don't have the power to take lives over, over minor situations or mishaps. We have to care for one another first and foremost. And no progress can be made unless the problem is solved where it starts at home. I mean, just think about it. When we were little, we all had heroes and people that we looked up to. So how about today we make the choices that could potentially save the life of our nephew or our son or our brother and be their hero? Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Marcus Villarreal. This year's election has brought us a great deal of some seemingly radical ideas. One of these ideas are free college. But this is not some crazy fringe idea pulled out of the depths of the Communist Manifesto. This is something that's been around in America for a long time. Since the 1920s, California has been passing laws to ensure that citizens are guaranteed a college education and that they can afford to go to school. Most nobly is President Johnson's Higher Education Act 
When this bill became law, he said that no student would be denied an opportunity to go to college simply because they were poor. It's 51 years later, and Johnson's vision has not been achieved. What we see, sadly, is a lot of seniors who are afraid to go into, into college. I'm friends with a lot of seniors. I eat well, lunch with them, I hang out with them, but these seniors, despite going to graduate, going into adulthood, a time that should be filled with joy and happiness, are clouded with fear and anxiety because they fear not being able to afford the education that they deserve, that they worked for. They fear because their families work day to day just to provide the next meal. They don't know how they're going to afford college. They don't know where they're going to find this money. And going forward, they're afraid. One of these seniors is my own sister, who since seventh grade has worked her hardest, has gotten straight A's before, and has tested very high on the ACT. And she was offered some of the best schools in our state, some good schools throughout the nation. And now her choices are limited to two options, because we can't afford anything else. We only have one full-time worker in our family, and there is nothing else we can do for her. And I, being a junior, myself am afraid, because I take the ACT this year, and no matter how I perform, I'm probably only going to be limited to one option myself. So with that, I urge everyone for a reform in our education system. I urge everyone to protest and fight for a better use of our tax dollars. This is not a right versus left issue. Both sides of the coin agree that there needs to be a change. Presidential candidate Bernie Sanders has talked before about tax subsidized dollars, uh, tax dollars going towards our education, and congressmen like Marco Rubio and Elizabeth Warren fight for this as well. And it's something that we need because as as college tuition rates have risen by 50% over the past 20 years, the people who apply have decreased to three quarters of what they once were. We must fight for good use of our tax dollars. The biggest argument against free college is that it's not free. But I would much rather pay out of my own pocket for a poor child's education than for another futile war bombing the Middle East. And there are those who would say, there are those who would say, those congressmen, that this is too hard, that we cannot achieve this. But you know what I say to that? I say maybe those people shouldn't be in Congress. And now, please give a warm welcome to Aisha June. Hello, everybody. My name is Aisha June, and I am a sophomore in high school. I go to a top performing arts high school for nine hours a day. From eight to five, I'm expected to be alert and aware. I'm expected to be alert and aware. Adding in rehearsals, some days I don't get home till 10 o'clock while still having to do homework. But I wanna tell you about my friend Sandra. She has been given the same expectations as me. But when she goes home, she experiences a completely different reality. Throughout the course of our sophomore year, she has been kicked out of her home seven times, arrested, put in juvenile detention, and hospitalized. While I was studying for finals and writing papers, she was trying to figure out where she was going to sleep that night. When we go to school, no one ever considers her stresses. How can she ever be expected to be the perfect student without being given support? Why is it that the lowest performing or the worst schools are those containing a majority of students from low income areas? Living in poverty is stressful. It's no wonder that these students can't perform at the same levels as their more affluent peers. Every time we push young adults to achieve higher test scores and higher grades and to be above average without breaking a sweat, it has an effect. These push factors to be exceptional on students takes a toll on health and stability. While the federal government is calling for schools across the country to raise test scores, shouldn't we allocate the same amount of time and energy towards benefiting the emotional and social health of a student? <sighs> maybe, maybe if there were a system in place to support our stresses, my friend wouldn't have gotten to the point where she was considering suicide. <sighs> 
schools need to start thinking about how they can support the health of a student instead of pencil piecing together curriculums to raise test scores. If we put as much energy as we do into academic standing, into the emotional well-being of a student, we can ensure that any student in poverty is given a fair chance to succeed. If we finally support students, no child will be left behind.